That's absolutely great. Hey, uh, an interesting thing. I, uh, how many of you were, when you were little kids, your parents taught you to pray, you know, like, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep if I should die. Anybody ever do that sort of stuff? Yeah. Hey, I just uh, found a couple of things for kids that were learning how to pray. A three-year-old uh, named Reese, he says, Our Father, who does art in heaven, Harold is his name. A little girl by the name of uh, Caitlin, uh, she's learning the Lord's Prayer from her mother. And her mother does as we often do with uh, kids. We give them a line and they repeat it back to us. And we give them a line, they repeat it back to us. And uh, finally, Caitlin's getting ready to go solo. And so she gets to that part of the prayer and it says, Lord, lead us not into temptation, she's prayed, but deliver us some email. <laughs> and one particular four-year-old prayed, and forgive us our trash baskets as we forgive those who put trash in our baskets. The theme is wireless, wireless. And I want to ask you a question. Are your spiritual arteries plugged? Now, I've talked to a few of the guys in here more than the, the gals, but how many of you have gone in and your doctor has said, you got a plugged artery? Anybody? There was about 50 people in the first service. <laughs> I mean, it was really, really classic. But what ends up happening is sometimes we don't take care of our physical bodies and our arteries get plugged. But here's a question I have for you. What if your spiritual life was patterned after your physical life and you had spiritual arteries? What are they? And would you know if those arteries were plugged or not? Just a question. Are your spiritual arteries plugged? Now, to help us get into this subject, what I want to do is I'm going to be dealing with the Lord's Prayer this morning, but I want to give you an understanding of the spiritual life. The first thing that I want you to understand is you and I have been created in what theologians call the Imago Dei. We've been created in the image of God. And what that means is that you and I are not primarily physical beings, we're primarily spiritual beings, and what happens is eternity is part of our DNA. Believe it or not, you were actually designed to live forever, which means that if your physical body ages and dies, what you were really designed for does continue, but it doesn't continue in the physical. It continues in the eternal and in the spiritual. Because the real you is not found in your body. The real you is found in your personality. It's found in your spirit. It's found in your emotions. It's found in your will. Now, if it is true that you and I are primarily spiritual beings then what ends up happening to our spirit is more important than what happens to our physical bodies. And caring for that spiritual part of us is more important than caring for the physical part of us. I'll guarantee most of us are going to go out after church or go home after church and eat lunch. We'll care for our physical bodies. But the question is, what will we do to care for our spiritual natures? Now, the problem with prayer and the problem with everything else, sins messed us up and messed us up good. Anybody say amen to that? Amen. Yeah, sins messed us up. So because of that, I'm going to give you three or four assumptions as we begin to look at this whole subject of prayer that are helpful. Number one, how many of you know that it's not a matter of if, it's only a matter of when, when you get to the point in your life when you say, I can't take it anymore, or I can't do it anymore. I'm done. I'm finished. We all get to those points in our life when life, as we understand it, we can't handle it. That's the first reality. Now, God is able 
to do exceedingly and abundantly above anything we could ever ask or think. He just does it that way. I used to joke with Pastor Chad. Some of you may have heard me joke with him. I used to joke with Pastor Chad, and I said, God doesn't answer your prayers. And he'd go, what? What? I'd say, yeah, he always does more than you ever ask for. He's the God of extravagance. He does exceedingly and abundantly, the book of Ephesians says, above all we could ask or think. Now what happens is if you look at the scriptures, the reality is, is that God has invited you and I to be, come into his presence anytime, anywhere, about anything. That's what he's done. He's given us the invitation. He said, whatever you need, go ahead and ask. Come to my presence anytime. God has given us that invitation. And because of that, how many of you know, with that invitation coming from God, our life would be a lot better if we did a lot less worrying and a lot more praying. Anybody with me on that? How many of you know that worry doesn't help, prayer does? And so here comes what we need to be aware of. The disciples asked the question, and we need to ask the question to the Lord. Lord, will you teach me how to pray? Lord, can you teach me how to pray? I need to learn how to do that. And so we're going to talk today about developing a fruitful prayer life, and we're going to use the Lord's Prayer as a model. And because of that, we need to recognize that prayer doesn't come naturally. Why do parents go in to the babies, to their children's bedrooms and try and teach them how to pray. Because the kid would play with their toys and then finally fall asleep and they'd never pray. It doesn't come naturally. You aren't built with a prayer gene. Well, maybe you are built with one. It's a prayer gene that goes like this. Help! <laughs> That's it. That's about the only prayer that is naturally built into us. We need to learn how to pray and uh, that's important. It's a learned skill. And if we have a pattern that guides our prayers. Any of you ever seen prayer guides? We put out prayer guides. Other people do. A guide is helpful to help us structure our prayer. So we're going to look today at unclogging your spiritual arteries. We're going to look at the Lord's Prayer, and we're going to look at that statement of Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray. Now, there's a guy by the name of Emmett Fox. Some of you may recognize the name if you've read or heard about a book called Fox's Book of Martyrs. He's the guy that wrote the book about the stories of all these great people who gave their lives to Christ. But one of the interesting things is he wrote extensively on the Lord's Prayer, and he said this about it. He said, it's the most important of all Christian documents, carefully constructed by Jesus with a very clear ends in view. It prob its use probably exceeds all the other prayers put together. Undoubtedly, everyone who is seeking to follow the way should make a point of using the Lord's Prayer and using it intelligently every day. Now, let's take a look at the scripture text, Luke chapter 11, verse 1. And here's what it says in the text. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Here's what my guess is. The disciples are watching Jesus pray, and they know that their prayer is nothing like his prayer. And so they say... He's got a connection with the Father that's different than the connection we have with the Father. So they come to Jesus and they say, Lord, teach us to pray. So now we look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13. And this is the prayer that Jesus taught them. So I want you to pray it, read it with me out loud and together. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
So here we have this prayer that Jesus taught us. Now I want you to answer a question for me because it's very important to understand that what we have here is a model, not primarily a prayer. Let me ask you a question. Now this is, this is where we have to start thinking. Do you think you'd have a good relationship with God if the sum total of your prayer took less than 30 seconds? But that's about what it took us to read that scripture text. So Jesus is giving a pattern around which we structure our prayer. He's not primarily giving us a prayer. Now, it's a nice prayer, and we use it in churches, and it's, we're blessed. But it should be reminding us of a larger issue that's raised by the prayer that would really lead us into a wonderful relationship with our God. So a model, it was a model taught by Christ to disciples. Now, when you get to the point in your spiritual life that you want to learn, God is far more willing to teach than you are to learn. How many of you know that? I mean, sometimes it takes God years for some of us before we finally wake up and say, oh, God, that's what you were all about? And we, we take time to learn. Now, this prayer follows a pattern that is well understood and well utilized within the Jewish system. And it had a parallel in the natural. It had a parallel in the natural. Let me explain this. What the Jewish rabbis believed is that we were physical beings and we were spiritual beings. And just as we had a physical voice, we had a spiritual voice. And let me give you an example. Jesus said, I only speak the words I hear the Father speaking. Now, that's not a physical speaking. That's a spiritual speaking. The spiritual body, the spiritual man acts. Jesus said, I only do the things I see the Father doing. There was a parallel in the spiritual. And what the Jewish rabbis were concerned about is are we caring for that spiritual part of us that connects us to the divine? There is a real spiritual person that is living within us that is prone to spiritual disease. Discouragement is a spiritual disease. Okay? It's a spiritual disease. Sin is a spiritual disease. Discontentment is a spiritual disease. Pride is a spiritual disease. Shame is a spiritual disease. Guilt is a spiritual disease. There's all sorts of things that get our spiritual man clogged, get our spiritual being clogged up. And so, to keep your spiritual arteries unclogged is to keep the life of God flowing through you. And the rabbis believed that knowing what we have to do to keep that spiritual nature strong is the most important of all lessons to learn. Now, prayer is a discipline to be learned. And why, while we can and should pray about everything, there are foundations. Now, Jesus teaches this prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. He teaches this prayer. Now, the disciples recognized the prayer when he prayed it. They didn't go, wow, never heard that before. They recognized it because Jesus picked up commonly used phrases from Jewish prayer life. Let me give you an example. Uh, Hallowed be thy name is reflected in the Kadesh prayer. Lead us not into sin is echoed in the morning blessing of Jewish prayer. A blessing said by some Jewish communities after the evening Shema includes a phrase quite similar to the opening of the Lord's Prayer. Our God in heaven, hallow thy name. And they conclude with the phrase, and thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth forever and ever. These were not strange phrases to the disciples. 
They were common. You can go to the book of Isaiah and you can literally, out of the book of Isaiah and the various prayers, you can actually reconstruct the Lord's Prayer. The phrases are all there. Jesus brings them all together. And so the construct of the prayer, or the way this prayer is constructed, it's constructed so that you couldn't miss its meaning. And time and culture and all the other things would not destroy it. The disciples were able, as a result of this prayer, to connect the spiritual dots. And it is a straightforward spiritual pattern that has remained down throughout history. Now the clauses in the fray, in the prayer, number seven, there's seven of them, and those are the seven arteries that the Jewish rabbis believed that we had. And what this prayer teaches is it teaches a pattern for the nourishment of the human soul and intimate communion with the eternal God. It connects us with God and God with us. So let's take a look at these seven spiritual arteries called unclogging your spiritual arteries. And there are seven of them. First is relationship, the artery of relationship. Second, the artery of worship. Third, the artery of priority. Third, the artery of provision. Fifth, the artery of forgiveness. Sixth, the artery of protection. And third and seventh, the artery of praise. Now, I'll get into that later. We'll just go on. So let me take you through each of these spiritual arteries very, very quickly. And I need to take a time out and I need to tell you about the notes you have. At this point, your notes should have a break and have nothing to do with what's actually going up on the screen. Okay? Because you should have two inserts in your, in your bulletin. One is a prayer guide. The prayer guide will relate to what I'm going to go through now. The other part is those introductory comments and notes to help you study and understand the Lord's Prayer. You got it? Okay, so don't worry about, the, uh, about this section as we go through it. You've got pretty comprehensive notes. Try and grasp what I'm saying on this. The first spiritual artery is the artery of relationship. It is the artery of relationship, and it says... Our Father, which art in heaven. All of us have a need to have a relationship with the living God. We need to have that relationship. And once we have it, we need to nurture it and we need to celebrate it. Now what we know from the scriptures is grace and mercy are the hallmarks of the way God deals with us. God gave us what we didn't deserve, a relationship with him, and he withheld from us his mercy. He withheld the things we did. He took us, he withheld the punishment due our sin, placed that punishment on his son. That is the basis of our relationship with God. Through the blood of Christ, I have a relationship with God. And so when I come to my heavenly father, I say, Father, I'm so glad that I can just come into your presence. I'm so glad I come into your presence, not on my own merit, but because of what your son Jesus has done. I want to praise you for the grace and the mercy and the love. And now what happens is I'm taking that need for relationship and I'm celebrating the relationship I have with God in my prayer. I start my prayer by acknowledging his greatness. I start by hallowing his name. Now, the interesting thing is the Bible says that this relationship you and I have with God comes through the faith of Jesus Christ. Look at Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 22 with me. It says, now a righteousness. Now, word righteousness is the Greek word diakosune, means right standing. It means it's a judicial term. It says, but now we are, there's a right standing we have with God that has been revealed apart from the law. How many of you know you could never be good enough to earn heaven? So there had to be a way to get there without keeping the law. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God. Now pay attention here because this is very important. Through the faith of Jesus Christ. 
Not faith in, the faith of. Now, why is that important? There's a tendency for us to think that the reason we have access to God is because we've got faith. No. The reason you got access to God is because Jesus had faith. Listen to me and pay attention because this is absolutely critical. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and prayed, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. As he submitted to the will of God to give his life as a sacrifice for the sins of all humanity, he died believing that he was dying for your sin and mine and believing that God would accept this sacrifice and raise him from the dead. He died in faith, believing God would raise him from the dead, triumphant over sin, death, and hell because of that. And that's the basis of my relationship with God. It is the faith of Jesus Christ. It's what he did. We sing an old hymn. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain, but he... He, he washed it white as snow. I don't come into God's presence on my own merit. I don't come in and say, God, I'm just thankful that I've got faith in you and that I'm glad that I can come into your presence. I say, no, Lord, I'm a beggar needing bread. And I come into your presence because of the blood of Jesus Christ and what he's done for me. Folks, we don't get proud in our prayer. We get humble in our prayer. Because we recognize we don't deserve the goodness and the graciousness of God. But he, because of Jesus Christ, calls us his kids. Do you understand that? That we have that relationship. And that's why the, the, the passage starts. Our Father who art in heaven, because there's a joy of being part of the family. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. And it is in knowing that relationship that allows me to come into the presence of God without fear and without fear of rejection. The second artery is the artery of worship. Hallowed be your name. One of the things that God chose to do all throughout history in the Old Testament and in the New Testament is he chose to reveal himself through his name. His name is what gives his character meaning. It is what shows us the majesty of who he is. And when we understand his name, we understand his character and why he is to be worshipped. Let me give you a quick tour of the name of God. His name is Jehovah. Jehovah. He is Jehovah Jireh. I praise him that he is my provider. He is Jehovah Nisi. He is, I praise him that he he gives me the victory. Jehovah Shalom, I thank him that he is my peace. Jehovah Rapha, he is my healer. Jehovah Kama, the God who is jealous over me. We sang that song. He's jealous for me. He's jealous for me. He is the God who, he, who loves you to the point that he will protect you from every foe, foreign and domestic. Jehovah Titsukenu, he is the God who is your righteousness. Jehovah Shema, the God who is there, the one who will never leave you or forsake you. Jehovah Rofi, the Lord who is your shepherd, Jehovah Titzaboth, the Lord who is over all, there is nobody greater than he. And so when you come into his presence, you come in hallowing his name, honoring his name. To honor his name is to honor who he is. And when you're praying, you praise him, you worship him, For how he has been to you more than enough. When you've been going through a tough time, you thank you that he is your provider. When you've been going through a tough time, you thank him that in the turmoil he has been your peace. You thank him that when everybody seemed to abandon you, that he has been there with you as your rod and your staff to give you comfort. You see, you're worshiping him. 
but you worship out of what you have experienced of his goodness and grace in his life. You just don't, you don't say, hallowed be your name, thanks, let's get on to the next thing. You take time to worship. The third thing, the spiritual artery of priority. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay? Now here's the interesting thing. God's will is always done in heaven. Always. Never not done in heaven. Always. And so we want in our prayers for that characteristic of heaven to be lived out on earth. Now let me just give you a simple illustration. How many of you know that when she gets to heaven, Margaret's going to love Jesus more than she loves me? Uh, This is not rocket science, folks. That's reality because when we get to heaven, we're going to be so deeply in love with Jesus that all earthly loves are going to pale in comparison. So what's my prayer for Margaret right now? Lord, I pray Margaret will be more in love with Jesus than she is with me. That's my prayer for her. Regularly. I want Margaret to be more in love with Jesus than she is with me. What's my prayer for my kids? My prayer for my kids is they'll always be more in love with Jesus than they are with their spouse, than they are with their kids, than they are with their jobs. Why? Because he alone is to have first place. There is no marriage relationship, there's no parent-child relationship, there's no job relationship that should ever take the place of Jesus is first in my life. Nothing. Nothing. And what happens in our lives is that's what gets messed up. We get all sorts of things screaming for our attention, and we lose that God first focus. And in a world that is all around us that tries to tell us that it's all about us, this portion of the prayer tells us it's not all about us. It's all about him. Now, as we pray, you and I need to recognize that this is the time when we get our orders from headquarters. Because if I'm to pray, thy will be done, you got to shut up and listen. Because ultimately what God has to say to you is a lot more important than what you've got to say to him. If you understand he's omniscient, he knows everything you're going to say before you even say it. Your problem is you don't understand what he wants to say. And so you have to spend that time listening and you say, Lord, I'm going to be going through this day, Lord, would you guide me? Lord, would you speak to me? Lord, may I hear your voice? Now, people say, is that kind of spooky? Hey, listen, every Christian, Jesus says, my sheep, what? Hear my voice. We hear his voice. And part of this aspect of prayer is learning how to listen to the voice of God. It's learning how to hear what he's saying so that we have guidance, so that we have rejection. Things. Let me just give you an example. We had this uh, random act of kindness in our prayer guide. Any of you look at that? Well, I got up that morning and I just simply said, Lord, today, I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know when it's going to be, but I need you to guide me to do something for somebody that needs your love and a touch from your love. I went through most of the day and I didn't hear anything. I'm getting off the freeway and there's a mother and father and two small kids that are homeless. And the Lord says, this one. As clear as can be. So I pulled over my car after the freeway, got out and talked to them found out that they were living in a tent and they didn't have any food. So I got the mother and one of the kids and we went up to the grocery store and got some food. Now, why did I do that? I did it because I heard from the Lord what he wanted me to do. I don't worry about what it cost. That's not even an issue. 
The issue was, I had prayed, Lord, guide me today. I want to do something in your name. So we go through the grocery checkout line, and the lady's starting to tear up. I just said to her, she said, why did you do this? I said, because Jesus loves you, and he wanted me to be his hand extended. And she started crying. But you see, that's just a example. There could be hundreds of examples, and I'm, I know all of you could give examples in your own life. But when you pay attention, when you listen, you begin to find that his will is done on earth, even as it is in heaven. Now, I'm going to probably get in trouble theologically, but let me venture in where angels fear to tread. Why did Jesus do the good he did all of his life? Was it because he was God? Well, if he did it because he was God, he can't have left us an example to follow in his steps because we're not God. Right? Does that make sense to you all? He did it because he listened to the Father 24-7. He paid attention to what his Father was saying. And that's what Jesus is teaching us. If you and I will pay attention to what the Father is saying, we will get orders from headquarters, and our life will literally touch, touch, touch people. It will make a difference wherever we live. So Peter Drucker, uh, our interesting uh, author, he says, we need to do first things first and second things not at all. We need to do the Lord's will on earth as it is in heaven. That's it. The, th the fourth uh, artery is the need for provision. Provision. Now, in provision, I need to praise God for his ongoing supplying of my needs. I've been around for a while, and I am constantly amazed how God takes care of me, how he takes care of my family, how he takes care and answers prayer for our needs. But there's a reality that we need to face. You and I, related to provision, need to be living in covenant. Okay? We need to be living in covenant. There is a covenant for those who are tithers. So, for example, I can praise God that he has been supplying all my need, but I thank him I can count on his continued supply because he has promised that he'd open up the windows of heaven for me because I have brought the tithe into his storehouse. How easy do you think it is for someone who is consciously robbing God financially to go to God for need? Hmm? Hard? I would think so. So you wonder why your needs are unmet. Your needs are unmet because you don't have the confidence that comes from being in a provision covenant. And that's what... Tithing is. Tithing is a provision covenant. And so I praise God. I don't have to worry. If I've got a need physically, and we're praying for somebody that's sick, or if we've got a need physically, I don't have any problem praying because I know that God has promised that he would open up the windows of heaven and bless me. He's promised that whatever I'd ask, he would answer. And I would suggest to you that we have a couple of steps in terms of this getting into a position of provision. One, we need to get away from the fact that what I have is because of my own effort. You don't gain any wealth, you don't gain anything else except the Lord provides it. It's the Lord that gives you the power. You acknowledge that everything comes from Him, you acknowledge that He asks you in worship to give a portion back to Him, and you give to Him all of your needs and He promises to meet them. That is the artery of provision. Selfishness clogs that artery. Then another spiritual artery is the need for pardon. The need for pardon. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Okay? The reality is, is that each of us have blown it in micro and macro ways. We've all blown it. 
I don't have a problem telling you I'm a sinner. I don't have a problem saying if you think you're perfect, you're going to ruin this place because all of us are sinners. That's what we are. But we're forgiven sinners. The blood of Christ has cleansed us from all our sin. And because of that, we need to recognize that guilt and shame are a hindrance to a clear conscience. These are the tools of the enemy. Guilt and shame are the tools that clog your arteries. You, you don't get over the guilt. You can't accept the fact that you've been forgiven. You can't accept the fact that Christ has given you his grace. But what we need to do is recognize that he's far more willing to forgive than we are even to confess. And we confess to God that which we know, and we let him take care of the rest. I confess to God where I know I've sinned, and I let God take care of the rest. Because it says, confess your, uh, it says to confess, and he will cleanse you. Confess your sin, and he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Confess what you know, and God will take care of the rest. The next spiritual artery is the need for protection. The need for protection. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, or more appropriately, most of the NIV and the other translations translate that correctly, protect us from the evil one. Protect us from the evil one. You and I, we've discussed this in, in terms of our spiritual uh, warfare series, but you and I are in a battle, and living in denial of the battle is a prescription for defeat. Now, the Bible tells us that he has given to us weapons of warfare that can tear down all the strongholds. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We have weapons, not carnal, but spiritual. And so we take and we ask the Lord to put a hedge of protection around our minds, around our emotions, around our spirits, around our will, so that we will be protected from the assault of the evil one. I've got news for you. In case you haven't been aware of it, Satan is not your friend. He is out to get you. And what we need to do is daily we need to put protection on. And the Bible says, put on daily the armor of God. Uh, we've got lots of information on that on the website, so I'm not going to go into it, but I want to read the scripture. Ephesians 6. Use every piece of God's armor to resist the enemy in the time of evil, so that after the battle you'll still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the sturdy belt of truth and the body of armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. In every battle you'll need faith as your shield to stop the fiery arrows aimed at you by Satan. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Every day I need to ask for God's protection. I need to put on the armor of God. And then finally, the need for praise. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I told you I was going to tell you something about this concept of, of prayer. When uh, you look in, in Luke, the phrase, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, is not in the gospel of Luke. It's in the gospel of Matthew. And the question is why? Why? Because... In Matthew, the phrases, the, the arteries are seven, what the Jewish rabbis talked about. In Luke, it's six. Who's right? Well, here's the interesting thing. Every Jewish prayer, every Jewish prayer, not simply the Lord's Prayer, but every Jewish prayer finished with the words, Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Every single Jewish prayer ended with praise. And all of our prayers need to end with praise. Why do we have a song of praise at the end of our services? Everything we do ends with praise because what it does is it once again turns our focus heavenward and says, you're able, Lord, you're worthy, Lord. We're submitting to you and we're going to move through this life with a song of praise in our heart because of all that you've done for us. That's the artery of praise. And the question is not why is it not in, in Luke, it's why is it in Matthew, 
Because everybody knew, everybody knew that any time you prayed, you prayed, thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever, amen. Now let me give you an illustration. Have you ever heard people pray and they finish their prayer and then everybody in the audience says, amen. They don't say amen. You say amen. Why? Because you know that's the way the prayer ends. You don't need somebody to tell you. Somebody prays a prayer and they don't use the words in Jesus' name and we all fill in, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay? There are ways to end prayer that are commonly accepted and just because you doesn't, don't use them doesn't mean they're not important. Is that making sense to you all? Okay, that's what happens. So you've got the power of praise. Verbally declaring God's goodness and greatness magnifies Him. How many of you know the more you magnify the Lord, the smaller your problems get? The bigger your God is, the smaller your problems are. And it results in His power flowing to us and through us. And what praise does is praise stops you from being self-absorbed. And what it does is it allows me to finish my prayer time with this confidence that no matter what I'm going through, I'm going through. No matter what, I'm, what trial I'm facing, my God is greater. It doesn't matter what battle I'm facing, I'm an overcomer. You know why? Because that's the kind of God I serve. That's the kind of God I serve. And I know who he is. And I praise him because of that. So those are the seven arteries. So let me close with giving you uh, just four quick reflections that are questions. Number one is as I've gone through these seven spiritual arteries, what part of your spiritual life is being undermined because of a spiritual artery being blocked? Is it the artery of praise? Is it the artery of worship? Is it the artery of protection? Is it the artery of provision? What artery is blocked in your life? Number two, is prayer a ritual or a relationship? Have you got beyond that I lay me down to sleep prayer? Or just reciting in 30 seconds the Lord's Prayer and thinking that that is the nature of how you should pray? Or are you opening your life up to an intimate, wonderful relationship with God. Pastor James talked about this, but if you don't have a time and you don't have a place, you don't have a prayer. If you don't have a time and you don't have a place, you don't have a prayer. And then finally, there's so much more. Say those words with me, so much more. So much more that God wants to do in us and through us and for us. And while a lot of other spiritual disciplines and practices are required, nothing God does falls outside the scope of prayerful supplication to Him. God has chosen to answer the supplications of His children through prayer and through answering those prayers deepen the relationship that we have with him. Amen? Father, we want to thank you for this opportunity we've had to take a fresh look at something we all knew, but Lord, maybe we didn't know it. And so we praise you and thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me give you one instruction with the handout in your, in your bulletin. I was fascinated by the statement of Jesus to his disciples. He said, could you not spend with me even one hour? One hour with the king. One hour with the Lord. What I've done is I've taken the Lord's prayer in those seven arteries, and I've set you out a prayer guide, and I want to challenge you. Sometime this week, take that prayer guide, and take, it may not take you the full hour, it may grow to that later, but sometime during the week, set aside time and using that prayer guide, go through and go through praising God for the relationship and worshiping Him for who He is. Go, th go
go through it, and what I think you'll do is you'll come back next week, and your life is going to be enriched and blessed because you've spent time with your Heavenly Father. Amen? Amen.